Good morning and, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jonathan Katz. Uh, I am the Director of Democracy Initiatives and a Senior Fellow at the German Marshall Fund in the United States. I just want to welcome everybody for joining today, for all those who are participating on, uh, on both sides, uh, both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I want to also just do a, a welcome for my colleagues uh, at GMF's Black Sea Trust, who are co-sponsoring uh, this event with our Washington office today. Uh, Black Sea Trust is based in Bucharest, but I think is, is really a critical component of the conversation that we're going to be having today. So on behalf of all of us, we want to welcome you. Uh, today's conversation is going to be focused on countering malign Kremlin influence, which is CMKI, which you're going to hear that acronym uh, a few times today. Uh, in our conversations. So I, I also want to welcome our esteemed speakers, including USAID's Brock Behrman, Ambassador Mark Green, Fiona Hill, and USAID Mission Directors uh, James Hope, Nancy Estlick, and Scott Hocklander. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. We have a really extraordinary lineup that I, that I want to get to as quickly as possible uh, to hear from them. But today's conversation, as I mentioned, is going to be focusing on efforts at USAID and within the US government to address one of the most significant foreign policy and national security threats to the United States and to our European allies and partners, uh, which is unabated Kremlin aggression. This challenge, as we know, is one that is not going away. If you look at even at today's headlines, you see uh, challenges, including the massive cyber attack, uh, which has been a reported attack by Russian hackers breaching US, uh, key US uh, departments and agencies, including Treasury and Commerce. We also see continued uh, Kremlin actions unabated, including support for authoritarians, including Alexander Lukashenko in Belarus, uh, despite his violence and detention of over 300 Belarusian citizens. The recent poisoning of leading opposition figure, Mr. Navalny, and the beginning of what we see as a clampdown of Russian civil society and media prior to the upcoming Russian elections on September 19th. The list of malign actions never stops and unfortunately it goes on and on and on. Uh, but it's countries really on Russia's periphery uh, and that includes not only the periphery but also uh, within the Western Balkans that have often experienced the full scorn and weight of Kremlin malign activities and efforts uh, including Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Belarus but it's not limited to these countries and we know that. So today's conversation is, is focused on these frontline countries uh, in these regions in these spaces and I want to highlight, you know, for this event, really the extraordinary work and effort of USAID's Europe and Eurasia Bureau, Assistant Administrator Brock Behrman uh, and his bureau for their efforts through the Countering Malign Kremlin Influence Framework, CMKI, which I mentioned earlier, which is really meant to address continued efforts by the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin to destabilize, weaken, and undermine democratic processes and institutions in Europe and Eurasia. Uh, this is really, I, I think, uh, one of the most forward-leaning efforts we've seen. It's based on fostering and building sustainable democratic resiliency and empowering partners, including civil society and independent media, uh, to combat disinformation, enhance cybersecurity, and strengthen good governance. So it also aims to address the Kremlin's use of corrupt economic means and energy bullying at the expense of its neighbors. C CMKI uses smart power, I like to say smart power, to fight Kremlin fire with flexibility and on the ground coordination, including with a whole of government approach, which I think we're gonna see when we hear both from, uh, from Ambassador Mark Green and Fiona Hill, but also working with mission directors who are on the ground, which is critical given the diversity of nations and populations impacted by the Kremlin aggression and influence. So there's not a one size fits all approach. And I like to think of this when I was reading through this great report, which hopefully everybody has had a chance to, 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 to read, uh, sort of looking at CMKI and its implementation, that it's sort of a three for one deal. CMKI seeks to address, mitigate Kremlin blind activities. It strengthens continued democratic transition in these countries. And through focus and sustained activities, it helps steal these countries and their populations from other malign actors as well. So it does a number of things that really are helpful uh, to these countries and to their populations uh, as they deal with Kremlin uh, aggression and malign influence. So I wanna kick off our discussion by briefly introducing our panelists. And I, I apologize beforehand for the brevity 
of, of these bios because they're extraordinary. Um, and so we want to just do it in a short manner just to welcome everybody. Um, and it, full bios can be found um, as part of the invitation. First, I want to welcome uh, Assistant Administrator, Administrator for Europe and Eurasia, Brock Beerman, um, who is really, you know, the really the, the, the one who has pushed this forward and really deserves a lot of credit. Brock is going to walk us through the CMKI implementation report, uh, and I think really jump more deeply into what has taken place over the since July uh, July of 2019 when this project and this effort and framework was officially uh, launched. And I just let me read quickly. Uh, Brock was sworn in on, in January of 2018 as the Assistant Administrator for USAID's Bureau for Europe and Eurasia. He brings considerable experience uh, to the Bureau from previous leadership positions with the Rhode Island House of Representatives, USAID previously, FEMA, Department of the Interior, and the private sector as well, and of course has uh, incredible extensive knowledge uh, in this region uh, as well. Next, I want to just introduce three stellar USAID mission directors whose leadership uh, in carrying out uh, CMKI, CMKI along with mission staff and, and our partners on the ground uh, have been critical. Uh, it's a really big welcome to uh, James Hope, USA's mission director for Ukraine and Belarus. Good to see you. Um, uh, Nancy Eslick, who's USA's mission director in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Scott Hocklander, USA's mission director in Moldova. Welcome to all three of you. I know how busy it is for you uh, in your respective countries to join us. It's also later in your day. Thank you for being here. Um, all three mission directors have, uh, if you look at their experience, have extraordinary experience in a number of other leadership positions in Europe, Eurasia, but also in the Middle East, um, in Asia. Um, and they've, they've actually all dealt in some of the most challenging development landscapes globally. And so I think it's a, the A team of, of mission directors that's here today. So thank you so much. It's an honor to have you join this conversation. I also want to welcome two um, incredibly important special participants. Um, many of them are known to those who are participating today. I mentioned both at the top of my remarks, uh, Ambassador Mark Green. Ambassador Green serves as the executive director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership. <coughs> Excuse me. Prior to joining the McCain Institute from August 2017 to April 2020, he served as USAID's administrator uh, and, and in that role um, helped launch CMKI uh, in July of 2019. So you'll, you'll see the interconnectors here um, of both of our additional speakers. Uh, prior to USAID, he served as the president of International Republican Institute, IRI, president and chief executive officer of the Initiative for Global Development. He also serves as the US ambassador to Tanzania and also prior to that served four terms in the US House of Representatives representing Wisconsin's 8th District. Ambassador, welcome. And as I mentioned, I really do want to highlight and, and uh, your leadership role as administrator in launching uh, CMKI in, in July 2019. Uh, I think, you know, uh, it takes, takes a, you know, sort of whole government approach to, to moving these types of projects forward. Um, and, and I think it's a perfect segue to, to bring in uh, Fiona Hill. Uh, Fiona, great to see you. Uh, Fiona is a senior fellow in, uh, in the Center on, on U.S. and Europe in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. Uh, she recently served as the Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director <clears throat> for European and Russian Affairs on the National Security Council from 2017 to 2019. You can see the timeline of CMKI and both the time of Fiona being uh, in, in the administration and Mark Green as well. Um, and so we want to thank you for being here, and obviously your your experience as well, um, not only at Brookings because you've been in a number of other positions as well, including uh, at the Eurasia Foundation, also within the National Intelligence Council from 20, 20, uh, 26, 2006 to two thousand nine, <clears throat> but obviously well known in this space, but also in terms of addressing the national security challenges. And what's interesting about today's event, and I'm going to turn it over to Brock and stop speaking, uh, is, is this interconnection between development and national security. And, uh, and I think um, as somebody who's, who's, who's a, an alum of USAID and, and the Europe Eurasia Bureau, um, I think it's just great that, 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 that this interconnection has been made. And I want to sort of praise the work that you guys have all done to, to make certain that this is 
uh, move forward on such a critical issue. With that said, let's let's get to our speakers. Uh, Brock, if I can bring you in to, to kick us off. <clears throat> and then what we'll do is we'll bring in the mission directors, uh, you know, to pick up, uh, you know, this conversation. So Brock, over to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Good morning and then good afternoon to where uh, some of our folks are overseas. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and thanks to uh, the GMF and the Black Sea Trust for hosting us today. Uh, providing this forum to update the public on USAID's work to counter malign Kremlin influence is critical. It's been about a year since then Administrator Green launched this important initiative, and we are pleased to present an update on the challenge of how we have implemented this framework. I also want to take an opportunity to thank Ambassador Green and Dr. Hill for agreeing to be here today. Uh, Dr. Hill also was intricately involved with the development of this framework, and I want to recognize her for that contribution. I also want to welcome representatives from the diplomatic community, civil society, and Congress, and our other stakeholders. Thank you for your continued support and support of building this framework. USAID consulted widely among the partners in the field across all of US government and with Congress as we developed the framework, and we want to keep that conversation going. First, I want to emphasize that USAID's priorities are guided by and advance the object ob objectives outlined in the National Security Strategy. <clears throat> the CMKI development framework reflects USAID's role in a whole of government approach to confront and push back against malign Kremlin influence. The bottom line here is across Eastern Europe and Eurasia, democracy is under assault. While these countries continue to pursue the hard work of democratic and economic reforms, President Vladimir Putin and his allies work to undermine their progress. Let me be clear, Putin's approach to development is a dead end, wrapped in a desire to bring back Russia's sphere of influence. The managed democracy Putin admits to amounts to nothing more than an authoritarian attempt to cloak control with a democratic facade. Given the nature of malign Kremlin influence, USAID is uniquely positioned to help US partners build resilience to Moscow's interference and to safeguard their hard-earned development gains. To meet this challenge, USAID launched its CMK development framework on the 4th of July in 2019. This strategic framework includes four key lines of effort, which correspond to our areas uh, to the areas of our partner vulnerabilities. Uh, these include, and as Jonathan mentioned earlier, democracy and rule of law, the information space, energy security, and economic independence, in addition to the cross-cutting issue of corruption. Over the past 16 months, we have reoriented our operations to integrate CMKI principles into our development program. USAID programs are having a real-time impact across major political and economic sectors right now. In fact, Nearly 95% of the Bureau's current regional and bilateral activities contribute directly or indirectly to CMKI objectives. Notably, we focused our activities across all the focus areas outlined in the CMKI framework with a notable emphasis on areas like independent media and energy security. In a moment, three of my colleagues from the field will give you a flavor of what they are working on on the ground. Moving, moving forward, USAID will continue to keep CMKI the, at the very core of its mission. We'll continue to expand our partnerships, build upon our progress, and refine the CMKI framework and programming to evolve alongside the needs of our partners. At the end of the day, to make progress on the region's development goals, we need to contend with and respond to the malign Kremlin influence. CMKI advances the journey to self-reliance of our partners in Eastern Europe and Eurasia, and that is USAID's primary mission. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm looking forward to uh, the rest of our conversation. And, uh, now I'm going to turn it back to you and my colleagues from the missions. Yeah, Brock, thank you for that that overview. And again, I, I sort of encourage people to sort of pick this up and take a look at 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 sort of the, the meat of what you've done, but also sort of I think it sort of fits in with what you're saying. Uh, but also, I just wanted one just one housekeeping thing before we started to uh, we would ask that if you would like to pose a question to our speakers to just use the Q and A function. Um, at the bottom or top of your screen. And you can pose at any point and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can throughout. Uh, I wanted to turn first, uh, you know, as you mentioned to the mission directors um, and maybe just start with uh, James Hope uh, in, in Kiev, who is, uh, you, know, you know, sort of all, all, I mentioned earlier, all uh, that all the countries, you know, mission directors representing countries today are on the front lines in one way or another 
in, in this challenge, and and certainly Ukraine and and Belarus uh, fit that fit that bill um, uh, in a way that that most other countries, uh, these two countries, uh, most others don't uh, have the same exact challenges. So, can I just bring you in to talk to you about this? And uh, thank you again for joining us uh, today and, and talking about CMKI and and implementation. I think you need to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, great. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jonathan. I guess with even despite all my experience, uh, I still struggle with uh, accessing all the various platforms. How many times have we all done that? Uh, okay, well, first of all, thank you and good morning and good afternoon, everyone from Kyiv, Ukraine. Uh, it's really great to join today's event. Uh, and share some of USAID Ukraine's experiences in implementing and operationalizing the countering malign Kremlin influence development framework. So let's start. Uh, Russia's military aggression in Eastern, Europe, in Eastern Ukraine, its attempted annexation of Crimea, pervasive disinformation campaigns, and multiple cyber attacks on Ukraine's financial and energy sectors all pose unique challenges requiring unique solutions. This means that successfully countering malign Kremlin influence is central to strengthening the development trajectory of Ukraine. And it's a core element of our strategic partnership with Ukraine. So at the mission at USAID Ukraine, we made CMKI a specific development objective in our country strategy. Our interventions and investments focus on improving access to independent information, to counter disinformation, energy security, good governance, as well as economic programs to mitigate the impacts of Russian aggression on the vulnerable populations in Eastern Ukraine. And as we noted in our country strategy specifically, Ukraine's greater self-reliance will not be possible until the country achieves a decisive break with its burden history of corruption and malign Kremlin influence. So at USAID, we've moved decisively to implement programs to implement the framework. And today I'd like to share just a few examples in two key areas, countering disinformation and election security. I should note that these are not only, these are not the only efforts aimed at countering Russia's malign influence in Ukraine. CMKI is a whole of government. It's a full scale US interagency effort by everyone from our colleagues in CDC to our colleagues in the State Department Public Affairs section. But the USAID efforts I'll talk about are indicative of different types of programming that are essential in combating Russia's malign influence. And this influence is growing in scale and severity as a major threat to Ukraine's reform process and stated goals of Euro-Atlantic integration. So let me start with countering disinformation. Vested interests in Ukraine, many aligned with the Kremlin, expend considerable resources on misleading and often blatantly false narratives about Ukraine. Their goal is to sow distrust and skepticism in the information space, erode confidence in the current government and undermine national unity and identity. Several major media outlets are owned by oligarchs who often cooperate with the Kremlin to air narratives promoting the idea of returning Ukraine to the Kremlin's fold. These channels regularly broadcast pro-Kremlin content, including most recently, pushing the Ukrainian government to adopt Russia's candidate COVID-19 vaccine for national rollout. And as we all know, these kinds of media outlets not only serve as a mouthpiece for pro-Russian agents and politicians, they traffic in the lies and conspiracies furnished by trolls and bots. They operate with little opposition on newly proliferating telegram channels and Russian controlled media networks such as Kontakte and Odnoklasniki, which can be accessed despite being outlawed via VPN networks. Disinformation about COVID-19 has been a growing challenge in Ukraine, part of what UNICEF has called a rising infodemic, seeking to reduce public confidence towards science and evidence. This is one of the reasons why we've responded with communications campaigns to counter this narrative. But it goes beyond COVID-19. For example, to expand access to quality information and improve media literacy, USAID and the public affairs section work with Ukraine's public service broadcaster, to cultivate demand for quality information. One such program, an independent political talk show called Countdown, is regularly viewed by 700,000 people. 
We're supporting an online initiative called Trolls UA, which is helping Facebook identify suspicious accounts that spread disinformation. A group of 265 volunteers has already captured 4,600 suspected troll profiles and worked with Facebook to close the accounts. Residents of Eastern Ukraine are most vulnerable to Kremlin disinformation and malign influence. Here, USAID helped establish a new TV channel and supports content development that provides high quality and objective information about Ukraine for Ukrainians in the Russian controlled territory. And USAID funded the installation of TV transmitters along the line of contact to allowing national broadcasters to reach an additional 2 million viewers. This has increased the reach of Ukrainian content and serves as an alternative. Let me quickly turn to election security and highlight how USAID is helping Ukraine ensure the integrity of its electoral processes. Ukraine has long been a testing ground for Kremlin efforts to develop its cyber warfare cap capabilities aimed at undermining elections. To counter these threats and strengthen the electoral system, in 2019 for Ukraine's elections, we helped the Central Election Commission procure hardware and train staff on a very tight timeline. Interventions were designed to mitigate and defend against destabilizing attacks on electoral processes and institutions. Later, the OSCE's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights reported that Ukrainian authorities successfully thwarted cyber attacks in the lead up to those 2019 elections. That investment by USAID paid dividends during Ukraine's local elections last October, conducted even more challenging under more challenging conditions due to COVID restrictions. We provided targeted training on cybersecurity awareness and cyber hygiene for nearly 400 election administrators and installed key enhancements and updates to the electoral monitoring infrastructure. This enabled the, this enabled the Electoral Commission and the state voter registry to better detect and respond to potential intrusions in voter registry networks and importantly, to better be able to centrally manage access to remote devices and security policies. In both these areas, countering disinformation and election security, a key to success has been close alignment and working in partnership with host, county, host country partners, both government and non-government, combined with flexible, well-resourced programs and strong and innovative partners. So what's next? The work isn't done on countering malign Kremlin influence in Ukraine. We just launched a major new $38 million project on cybersecurity to strengthen the capacity of Ukraine's critical infrastructure to withstand future cyber attacks. This is the highest priority of the government of Ukraine. At the same time, a new strategic communications project is scaling up work, USAID's work on helping Ukraine's institutions more effectively message to citizens in order to counter Kremlin-driven disinformation campaigns that try to undermine Ukraine's reform process. So as you can see, our CM, CKMI, uh, CMKI efforts in Ukraine are multifaceted and have been effective so far in addressing a critical threat to the country's sovereignty and self-reliance. They demonstrate and advance USAID's overall CMKI development framework, and they're going to remain a priority in the years to come. Thanks very much for the chance to speak today. Jim, thank you. Um, and it's good to hear about all the things that you laid out uh, that, that USAID and the US government are doing in, in Ukraine. Uh, cybersecurity, I mentioned up top, we, we have challenges, it seems to be some Russia, Russian challenges as well on that issue too. And I think it's a global issue, but I think for Ukraine, I know this is such a, a, a great challenge and uh, combating disinformation uh, but also related to COVID-19, which you mentioned, which I did, I, I'm sorry, I missed saying that. Of course, uh, the information uh, warfare that's out there regarding this or about, uh, about this particular issue or about Ukraine's uh, democracy and reforms uh, is critical. And that's been part of Russian uh, or at least Kremlin strategy in trying to undermine uh, Ukrainian leaders, civil society and Ukrainian citizens. Uh, you know, your next door neighbor in Moldova has also uh, next to uh, in the same neighborhood uh, has also you know experienced a lot of the same challenges. You used the word uh, testing ground um, for Ukraine uh, for Kremlin aggression, and you're right; it sort of forecasts what happens elsewhere. Uh, but Moldova has obviously been in uh, also 
has faced similar challenges as well. So I wanted to bring in uh, Mission Director Scott Hocklander. Scott, good to see you. Um, and uh, you did a perfect job at taking off your uh, taking the mute off um, uh, to start. But uh, obviously, Moldova has really faced um, a lot of challenges, economic as well. Um, you know, and trade has been important. Where USAID has been uh, really working hard to support them, energy. Uh, but I'm going to let you speak uh, about this, and uh, and I, we want to hear from you. So over to you, Scott. Yeah, super. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, uh, for the invitation. Uh, on behalf of USAID Moldova, it's certainly a pleasure to be here, uh, particularly with such an esteemed panel. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, my Sanu's decisive November 15th presidential election victory was representative of change in Moldova many years in the making. Weary of corruption, uh, disruption, and perpetual state fragility maintained by malign actors. Voters in an increasingly free and transparent election chose to align their hopes and dreams for a better Moldova to an independent candidate with strength and ties to the West. Malign influence in Moldova and other countries limits opportunities, fosters dependence, breeds disillusionment, and sows distrust in critical systems. At USAID Moldova, we seek to counter these influences across our portfolio by offering the opposites. As malign influencers stifle opportunities, USAID's creates them. We work with multi-generational entrepreneurs and businesses to open up econ economic trade with Europe. As of 2020, 53 agribusinesses proudly held Global Gap certification, assurance of quality, thanks to USAID support. Renowned Moldovan produce, now packaged to the highest standards, penetrates reliable and lucrative new markets across the EU and as far as away as Qatar and India. Bulk rates and politicized trade relations are becoming a thing of the past. While malign actors foster dependence, USAID supports a resilient economy and self-resilient institutions. Our business association partners have become effective change agents, transforming their sectors through vertical and horizontal integration. They lead USAID-founded public-private partnerships with government counterparts to solve Moldova's development challenges. Our work in the energy sector will integrate Moldova into the surrounding market for electricity and gas supply, and move Moldova beyond single source dependency. While malign actors breed disillusionment, USAID creates hope and aspiration in youth. Our centers of excellence for IT and creative industries link students to tech companies hungry for talent in Moldova's fastest growing sectors. These jobs are exciting, cutting edge, and offer wages 230% higher than the average. Young Moldovans increasingly believe that they can compete for success on a global scale. Just last year, the Moldovan national robotics team won a global competition in Dubai. To counter disinformation, USAID builds trust in students through media literacy so young Moldovans can distinguish fact from fiction, in information where strengthened independent media provides alternatives to a media bought and built to mislead, in critical systems through support for fair and transparent elections. I tracked on November 15th, the vote count of Moldova's presidential election on the Central Election Commission online system supported by USAID. The system worked as designed, showing democracy in action, real time, and withstood a cyber attack from those threatened by a citizenry exercising its rights. Disingenuous actors intent on restricting the development of the entire country to further their own interest should be exposed and countered. In Moldova, we go further, believing paving a positive path characterized by trust, hope, opportunities, and self-reliance is the best way to partner with Moldovans transforming their country. Um, those are my prepared remarks, uh, Jonathan, and I'm uh, happy to, to participate in the Q&A section. Great, Scott, thank you. And thanks for reminding us of the, the recent election of Maya Sandu, which is really yeah. a really extraordinary moment for Moldova. Um, but the challenges that you outlined um, are, and good to hear about all the things that you're doing and will be doing. Um, and um, it's uh, really important. And I know that there's also one thing I wanted to point out all this is that there's just tremendous cooperation also with partners and allies, including European partners on the ground in, in, in all these countries uh, doing this together. So I think it sets an example uh, for, the, for addressing the challenge. Um, and USAID and US government leading the way uh, on these issues. Can I, I'm gonna turn right now to, to, uh, to the Balkans. Uh, Nancy, you, you know, thank you so much for joining us um, and really looking forward to hearing from you because when I 
when we heard from from Jim and Scott, um, Western Balkans has its also has its challenges too, uh, from from economic challenges, but also malign actors, um, and including including the Kremlin that um, that make it challenging for a region that has faced a lot of uh, adversity, um, and still in trying to want to you know to succeed democratically. Uh, Bosnia is one of the most complicated uh, spaces uh, for these issues, and and I wanted to you know to bring you in maybe just to talk about how CMKI is is implemented and and projects. But I wanted to hand the floor over to you to hear about this. So over to you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And good morning and good afternoon to all my colleagues. I'm so pleased this morning to uh, join this distinguished panel to discuss the importance of countering malign influence in the region. And thank you very much, Assistant Administrator Bierman, for the invitation. Um, as Mission Director in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I've seen firsthand the efforts of the Kremlin and others to meddle and to exert influence in the Balkans. In some ways, BIH, with its ethno-political cultural differences, is a petri dish from malign influence. USAID's response here is necessary and it's robust. USAID BIH actively counters malign influences from the Kremlin and other actors throughout our programming. We work in four key areas. The first three address democratic institutions and rule of law, media and other disinformation, and reducing economic vulnerabilities manipulated by the Kremlin. I want to spend a bit of time talking about our fourth area, energy. In a way, it's ironic that USAID finds itself countering Kremlin influence in BIH's energy sector, considering we rebuilt the power grid here after the war just 25 years ago. Now, Russia supplies 100% of the natural gas needs of BIH, and it also owns the only oil refineries in the country. Like so many other areas in BIH, the country has the capacity, but the government lacks the commitment for real change energy independence would be a huge step towards self-reliance. Instead, the lack of commitment is just another stumbling point. USAID BIH has built infrastructure and worked in energy policy for nearly 20 years. Since CMKI started, USAID's energy policy activity has been assisting BIH to coordinate, manage, and improve transparency in the gas and electricity sectors. We're also providing targeted technical assistance to improve the simplified energy policy environment and the legal framework. In a major achievement assisted by USAID, the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina in October approved a draft law on the South Natural Gas Interconnection. The law has passed one chamber of parliament and it's now headed to the senior chamber for approval. This was a major step in energy security as the law will facilitate the construction of a new pipeline that will connect BIH and Croatia and their natural gas systems together. It will help enable the diversification of natural gas sources, including access to the Kirk liquefied natural gas facility in Croatia. Other energy sector reform efforts continue. USAID is also assisting Bay Age authorities in drafting of the critical state electricity and natural gas law. This law will, among other things, provide clear regulations for the natural gas sector countrywide, which is a significant EU energy treaty requirement and will boost investments. Other components of our energy work here will boost renewable energy investments, improve energy strategies and action plans, and assist in developing an energy sector cybersecurity roadmap. In public outreach, we're working to promote a market-based energy sector by informing the public about the benefits of and the requirements for European Union membership. Our work with the Regulatory Commission, both to expand their websites and to provide transparent energy price comparisons allows consumers to make informed retail choices, as well as support the independence of the energy regulators. USAID's assistance is a strong example, and it'll stretch farther than the influence of malign actors, and will continue to partner with the BIH on its journey to self-reliance. Thanks so much for letting me dig into BIH's energy work. Thank you, Nancy, and I know there's a lot more happening. You know, one, there's the energy challenge, you mentioned both the uh, there's obviously multiple malign actors in in this region, but also the, the internal challenges politically, um, and also the specter of Euro-Atlantic integration, which is you know which is sort of wedged within all of these 
uh, you know, projects too, is that, you know, strengthening the ability of these countries, the resil democratic resiliency helps them um, achieve the, the goals that, that you and others have set out in terms of, of Euro-Atlantic integration, which is really important. So um, that's, that's part of this, uh, part of this process as well. Uh, I want to turn now to, and I'm, I, you know, I apologize that we're not spending more time with each one of you talking about the programs, because I think that could be a program into itself. We will do more. But I wanted to first turn to, to Mark Green. Um, and uh, Ambassador Green, great to see you again. And, uh, um, you know, you've played a number of le leadership roles from, from Congress to IRI and then at USAID. And, you know, in all of your, in all sort of spaces you've worked in, including in Tanzania as well, you know about, the, about both about development challenges, but also um, security threats, threats to the United States. Um, in particular, obviously, uh, this is something that was launched under your, you know, under your leadership um, in 2019. If we could just bring you in to to speak to speak about CMKI and and also uh, your thoughts in terms of, um, of 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 these challenges, and then we'll bring in Fiona as well to speak. As Brock mentioned, it takes a whole government approach to try to uh, address these challenges. So, Ambassador Green, if I could send it over to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, and, and thanks to the German Marshall Fund for hosting us. Uh, I'll keep my remarks uh, real brief. Uh, if there is any thread, Jonathan, to the work that I've done over the years, it's that I've been fortunate enough to surround myself with people that are much smarter than me and get out of the way and let them uh, lead. So congratulations to Brock and the team for the great work that's been done here. So, uh, you know, obviously each and every day we see more evidence of Putin's malign influence and design. And really, I, I think the brazenness of it all really uh, begs the question, what's going on that we don't know? And I think that's a key part to this, understanding that what makes the headlines, what's being reported is really just scratching the surface. And that's really the importance of CMKI. It aims to help build resilience of vulnerable partners, but also reinforce partner institutions as part of a, of a broader mission that protects them against this malign influence. Uh, it really fits in well with the broad purpose at USAID of fostering uh, the journey to self-reliance for each country helping citizens uh, to have stronger institutions that they can turn to and hold accountable, helping them to tackle corruption, reaffirming the enabling environment for private enterprise, and, and strengthening that ethic of citizen responsiveness in government itself. So, uh, you know, a significant part of CMKI is recognizing that the tactics and tools emanating from the Kremlin are evolving with each day. It, it, this is not something that's standing still. You know, political observers have often categorized the power of statecraft in terms of hard power and soft power. I think we recognize increasingly these days that there's also uh, what the National Endowment for Democracy terms sharp power. Sharp power is a form of power and tactics coming out of the Kremlin, not solely out of the Kremlin, but out of the Kremlin, really designed to pierce democracy and to pierce the social compact in democracies in ways that undermine the confidence of the democracies, weaken their ability to have that citizen responsiveness and undermining self-reliance in terms of economic power. And so that's something that we have to be thinking about each and every day. Uh, this report, this interim report that's out is something that we should all uh, lift up because it shows the logic and the framework behind CMKI. It shows how it fits in with the broader purpose that we have uh, in the US government of helping our partners rise up and be uh, self-reliant, recognizing, recognizing their own future. And then the final piece that I'd like to remind everybody of is why it's called countering malign Kremlin influence. That term was chosen in recognition that our battles are not with the people of Russia. In fact, just the opposite. We are siding with the people of Russia. 
few years ago in my IRI days, I remember something that Vladimir Karamurza, one of my heroes in Russia, said. He had just come out of his first coma. And he, we sat down and I said, do you have any tips? Do you have any counsel for someone like me in, in the democracy field? And he looked at me and he said, never, ever, ever give up on the Russian people. And I think that really is what is at the heart. That spirit is part of CMKI. It's recognizing that people everywhere, including in Russia, want the same thing that we do. They are held back, they are held down, they are undermined, they are bullied by an authoritarian cabal in the Kremlin. We have the opportunity with CMKI to side with the people of this region who are seeking the same things that we seek in a brighter future and also to side with the people of Russia and help them realize their own aspirations. That's part of what American leadership should mean. And I think that the great mission directors who are on the call today, you can tell from the work that they're doing each and every day, they're working to try to lift that up and make it happen. So again, I, I'm proud to see this interim report and, and uh, also just proud to see the team and the great work that they continue to do. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you for that. <clears throat> but both about the points about sort of the role of, um, of USAID and the mission directors too, which definitely should be touted and also those that they work with on the ground at the, at the missions and, and in the Bureau too, I think is so important. But also the idea that the, the terminology is Kremlin and engaging Russians, that's something that, that we need to uh, continue to focus on and think about how the US can do more to expand that engagement and I, with the exact right message uh, so I'm going to, uh, I want to pick up on those themes and, and turn to, to, uh, to Fiona Hill uh, to pick up on this. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we've talked uh, and we've heard from the mission directors from Ambassador Green and, and, uh, and Brock Behrman. Um, you, Brock mentioned that you obviously played a role too in, in support uh, from the national security, from the NSC. Uh, and I just wanted to to bring you in and, and obviously to, to speak to you know, this challenge. And obviously it's something that you have focused on for many years, uh, both the relationship uh, with Russia, the Kremlin, um, and I think you've seen it in different iterations and maybe just speak to the importance of, of this work uh, being done. And I think Ambassador Green mentioned sort of this, this framework that's been set up that sort of lays out, I think in a very Sort of logical and also an important way, so we understand what we're what we're doing, what we're trying to achieve, um, and and I think I think in the right manner. So if we could just turn it over to you, um, and again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and I just want to commend everyone for really uh, excellent work. It's wonderful, as um, Ambassador Green was saying, to see something come into fruition. And I know how hard Brock, James, Scott, Nancy, and all the others who have been involved in this effort. Um, have, uh, have worked on this. I think the important element is one of partnership, uh, which has been stressed right from the beginning. And that's a partnership with all of our counterparts in the other countries. Uh, the other issue that's uh, an important point for people to bear in mind is that of vulnerability and shared vulnerability, mutual vulnerability. As each of our colleagues from the USAID field offices has mentioned, uh, many of the vulnerable, fragile countries of the region have proven to be backdoors into attacks on us as well in the United States, as well as more broadly in Europe. Um, as James was saying, uh, Ukraine has often been the testing ground uh, for malign activity, similarly with Moldova and uh, other countries in the Balkans, uh, also in the Caucasus, which is another area that uh, Brock and the team um, have been working on. And we have sometimes had a failure of imagination ourselves to see how the same tactics could be applied against us. 2016 and uh, the Kremlin sponsored intervention into the US uh, presidential race, I think woke all of us up uh, to the potential and the possibilities that our own democracy could be attacked in that way. And I think you know, since then, 
uh, these kinds of efforts that USID have put into place have been a very important element of tackling this. I mean, I can see uh, as everyone was speaking that we've got an amazing array of questions in the Q&A that touch upon these very um, issues directly. And, you know, I think it's important for us to be able to get to that exchange uh, with the audience because everybody who's on this list, I've been also looking down the very impressive list of attendees are part of this whole exercise because USAID programs, again, their partnerships, including with think tanks like German Marshall Fund and, and many others, but also with private citizen groups in the region, more broadly in Europe, uh, and also our counterpart governments, and here in the United States itself. And I would actually hazard to say that the framework that USAID has developed for fragile states in um, Eastern Europe um, and in some of the former Soviet space could also be applied here at home, because 2016, revealed also weaknesses in our own democracy and um, our own institutions. And I think that framework could be adapted as we think forward about how do we start to strengthen the resilience of our own dem democracy, which has taken some hits over the last several years. So that framework is an extraordinarily useful one for use both at home and abroad. And I just want to commend our colleagues for really passing out the different elements that we need for resilience uh, to uh, these attacks. And again, on a, just on a final note, um, as Ambassador Green said, this is not directed at the Russian people, and it's not actually directed at all of the institutions of Russia either. I mean, all of us have had um, you know, excellent opportunity, uh, including in, in my time at the NSC, to work with our counterparts, Russian diplomats, um, who are extraordinary uh, diplomats, uh, and you know, across the professional apparatus of Russia. Really what this is, is to try to push back against the line activity from those who are engaging in subversive covert activities. And this also has to be made clear as well. There is plenty of scope as we look to the future with a new US administration coming in to work with Russia itself at an institutional professional level to try to stabilize the relationship. What we're trying to say, and what our colleagues at USAID are saying is let's get put an end to this subversion and let's build up our own resistance and resilience to this so we can push back. And I think, you know, as you said at the outset, Jonathan, we've got plenty of headlines underscoring the fact that we have to do that. There may be cyber, you know, issues that we have to tackle on the resilience level, but there are so many other things that we can do to push back against disinformation and to find ways in which we can cooperate together. Another part of USAID is to tackle the big challenges and the pandemic underscores that that's an area that we have to work on. This is another area that USID and other counterpart organizations work on in trying to uh, promote cooperation on public health. So let's focus more on public health and cooperation and let's push back against this covert activity that really seeks to undermine all of our resilience and you know get ourselves back into action again so i just want to commend our colleagues for really an excellent interim report it's very heartening to see the success and the progress that they have made and again partnership is the essence and as i said i can see we've got some great questions here so back to you jonathan and thanks for the opportunity to be able to uh, join everyone today thank you uh, thank you for that and i wanted to you know obviously point out what you said about um obviously we can apply the lessons learned in in countries like ukraine uh, and that's certain, there's a certain amount of expertise as well that these countries have uh, already in, in dealing with these challenges that, that we can learn from. And I think I've heard the word partnership, we partner with, you know, with, 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 with governments, but also with civil society, you know, as a, with, when you're talking about USAID, talking about uh, a number of people in different sectors. So there's a lot to learn and engage. So thank you for that. And I, I did want to come back to you and, and, and certainly just pick this up with a couple of quick questions. We do have a lot of questions in the queue, uh, but one I wanted to, <clears throat> if you wanted just to connect to you and maybe Ambassador Green you want to talk to is about how you connect this work to the national security. Um, and I, I think it's so important sometimes the development lens is, is not sort of placed in the proper priority level when we're dealing with these national security challenges and maybe just talk about you know where where we should be prioritizing uh, this type of work um, not only you know cmki is obviously is is, is certainly a, a major component we're focused on that today but how do we strengthen uh what ambassador green spoke about which is sharp power um but sharp power on the side of the us you call it smart sharp uh, sometimes people call development soft power, but I always think it's so hard to actually do and to maintain and sustain. So it's it's hard. It's a hard effort. So maybe you could speak to the to the issue of of 
National Security Ambassador Green, maybe we could bring him in as well. And Brock, please feel free to jump in at any point. Well, let me uh, jump in first, actually, on a, uh, a platform that you've already laid out there in terms of soft power, because um, as many people have observed, when the Kremlin um, uses uh, soft power, including Russian soft power, even some of its uh, great cultural achievements, it does that in a rather hard way. So the Kremlin certainly doesn't see uh, soft power um, in, in the same way that others might as something that's irrelevant to a national uh, security perspective. And I think from the national security point of view, it's evident and should be evident to everyone that the divisions within society and the weaknesses and fragility uh, lead to national security concerns and crisis, because it's those back doors uh, that uh, the Kremlin and other malign actors, there's been questions in the q and I can see about China and, and others, for example, that they step through those vulnerabilities that they can exploit uh, from um, a national security perspective. You know, if we use the analogy of uh, software weaknesses, you know, we've just seen uh, um, in the headlines, the reports um, of cyber attacks on our government agencies that we're using, you know, the software updates. Um, uh, and th this is kind of, you can analogize this out into society overall. If our societies are weak, uh, they're, they're, they're vulnerable, there's a lot of division, there's a lot of infighting, uh, there is a lot of economic inequality and grievance, those are um, areas that the Kremlin and other malign actors can exploit. So we see a lot in the disinformation space in particular as well that what um, Kremlin actors have done, the Internet Research Agency and others that you know, have been highlighted, they look for disputes within a society. Um, in 2016 in the United States, uh, they um, you know, exploited divisions over race, over gender, over issues like arms control, abortion, all of the hot button issues in political discourse, which they've done in other places like Ukraine and Moldova and in the Balkans, where there are conflicts uh, you know, in, in, uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, for example, and then they exacerbate those. So it's either kind of in propaganda, you know, propagating um, the information uh, that's likely to get people riled up, or even actually, you know, there's mentioning in a CMKI report about trolls and other fake personas that are adapted on um, in, on Facebook and on uh, Twitter and you know out there using social media platforms to actually propagate disinformation on these key issues. And we've seen this in the COVID space right now, which of course has life and death concerns uh, about misinformation, about the, uh, the disease, uh, about vaccinations, about the safety of vaccinations, uh, all of these issues that are in intended to weaken people's trust and faith in their own institutions. And that is part of the weakening overall of our civil society and of our resilience to resist these kinds of, uh, of attacks. So it makes us more vulnerable to attack, hence why there is a direct link into the national security space. And I'm sure that um, Ambassador Green has a lot to say on this topic as well. Thanks. So uh, I would put it this way. The importance of CMKI in terms of the national security strategy is that it recognizes what the sources of American power really are. It's not simply the hardware. There are other countries with hardware. It is instead the values that we project and in foreign policy, development policy, the bargain that we offer. And it requires us to be very clear about that bargain and how different it is from authoritarian uh, power. So uh, what we offer in the journey to self-reliance, it's not easy. We recognize that the steps that need to be taken in order for a country to rise, to have a sustainable economy and, and real opportunity often involves difficult choices. But at the end of the journey, a country gets to lead its own future. It is independent, it is strong and better able to meet the aspirations of its people. The authoritarian bargain does the opposite. It's seductive because it offers easy solutions, cash up front, and in a dark way, it often um, it enables uh, media to scapegoat uh, vulnerable communities. And what it offers at the end of its journey is dependency and, and servitude. And so countries that are lured by the seduction of sharp power tactics from the Kremlin end up losing their future. And so I think we have to be very clear on what it is that we offer. 
We have to be very clear on the risks of the other side. And then finally, and it gets at a little bit of what uh, Fiona's been talking about, we also have to offer it with a sense of humility. I think sometimes what happens is uh, as a country and as a people, we find ourselves on the defensive too often. We overlook the flaws and setbacks that we have as a political system and as an economy. And my view has always been, no, we admit them. What we should do is with a sense of humility and say, look, um, we're not saying we've got all the answers. We're saying, in fact, maybe we've made all the mistakes. And what we offer our friends is an opportunity to learn from our own shortcomings. It took us a long time to extend the vote to a, a range of communities. But we recognize that um, ourselves and our partners are on a journey together in helping people to meet their aspirations. It isn't easy, but we offer hope and the other side seeks to undermine it. And I think it's a message that we need to repeat over and over again, because otherwise, if we find ourselves caught up in a tit for tat with authoritarian sharp power, uh, in some ways we foster that sense of complexity and confusion, which is what Putin's hoping for anyway. So to me, it's the a hopeful message that we need to repeat like a drumbeat each and every day. Thank you. And I think an important point on sort of these, these, this stark difference between these two, two roads, these two paths, and couldn't agree with you more that, that it's got to be a, a top priority as it has been in, in CMKI and then also in the work that's been done. But I, I, and I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion that it will be a, a major focus going ahead. Uh, that leads me to that question about sort of, uh, you know, maybe I'll turn to Brock too um, on and then maybe on the mission directors too, is just a question about sort of, you know, further oper, opera, you know, oper, oper, operationalizing CMKI, sorry. Um, and how you sort of look at that sort of going forward and, and you know, what, what would be next. And I think it, it, it comes to the mission directors obviously too, because uh, of implementation of a number of things that Brock that you laid out and, and the mission directors laid out in, in terms of some of the programmatic work that is like in motion, is in train. Uh, great thing about uh, USAID and, and sort of the work being done too is the sustainability that these are projects over multi-year. And so, and, and they're big investments. And I, you mentioned some of these projects even uh, in sort of all these countries that are sort of underway uh, that are really important to, to continue and support. And uh, so I wanted to, Brock, maybe just hand it over to you to talk about about the future, because I think it's sure. it's great to, we, we can talk a lot, but you guys are actually, you guys, you're doing it. So thank well, you, Brock. Th thank you, Jonathan. And, and again, uh, thanks to all the panelists and Ambassador Green, uh, Dr. Hill. Look, I, I think um, both um, Ambassador Green and Dr. Hill summed it up very, very uh, concisely, right? It's about partnerships and it's about uh, pushing back on an authoritarian approach. This is not about Russia. This is not about the Russian people. We're looking to partner with uh, Russia. Uh, we're looking to take uh, uh, opportunities and advantage of uh, areas where we can work together and find that common ground. And I think that's really important. And, and Jonathan, to answer your question to some degree, I don't believe it's necessarily what's next, right? It's more about what, el what else? What else can we put in that toolbox? Uh, I think it's important that we recognize that um, you know we need to be more proactive, right? We need to be... Um, uh, we, have, we need to embrace democracy. I, I think at the end of the day, democracy um, uh, speaks for itself and uh, we can be more positive and we can uh, work toward programs that uh, embrace democracy. And, and as I think back about uh, the SEED Act, if you will, right, in 1989, as uh, they developed that SEED Act and in supporting Eastern European democracy, I think now it's more of a matter of strengthening Eastern European development. Right. Um, look, I, I think that what what else? And again, I think uh, there will always be a need for countering. Um, there will always be a need to identify malign influence. But I also believe that we need to look at this from an approach where um, our partners understand that their journey, right, their their liberties and prosperities to self reliance ultimately lie along democratic paths. Right. This is not because the United States said so. It's because every citizen 
has the opportunity to have a voice. So as I think about what else we're going to do, it's a matter of embracing uh, a proactive and positive approach and looking for that common ground and making sure that we identify opportunities moving ahead to partner and to recognize that the Russian people play an important role in the development of not just Eastern Europe, but globally. Um, do any of the mission directors want to come in on that? And also, we do have, um, Brock, thank you for sort of laying that out too, because I think you, you're saying, you know, you know, like next is now, and also sort of laying out this uh, increased focus and dedication to it. And I like the idea that, you know, democracy, you know, does speak for itself. Um, and then, you know, sort of coupled with the work that's being done to promote this, um, you know, obviously showing, you know, examples on our end to others is really important. Uh, Jeff, well. Before you jump to our part, I just really think it's important to recognize that this CMKI effort, right, on malign Kremlin influence was identified in a way to identify the problem, right? It's not countering Kremlin influence. It's not countering Russian influence. It's malign. And so when we look toward opportunities to work with Russia on, on opportunities that help everyone, of course, we're going to jump at that opportunity. It's, it's critical. And I just I see a lot of questions there. There are 24 questions. We're never going to get to all of them. But I do believe it's important that people understand that we're working with our partners. We are working with our partner countries. They are working alongside us. And they are spreading a, a much more positive, proactive approach to the work um, that helps our countries be more self-reliant. Thank you, Brock. I did, I'm, I'm trying to, um, yeah, please jump in. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, so I, I wanted to give a little bit of context from Sarajevo in terms of how we're going to operationalize um, CMKI. And I think one of those is that we stand stronger with our fellow, fellow development partners when we present a united front, such as um, trying to work with the DIH government on the state electricity and gas law. Um, I know that both uh, the embassy and USAID, um, we are in line with both the EU, um, the Brits and the IMF and others to make sure that uh, we are all presenting information on what Euro-Atlantic uh, integration means in terms of economic opportunities um, and, and working to create uh, the best pos possible opportunities for the BIH government to make the right decision on things. I, I think also along those lines, it's about um, identifying those actors that have the real positive chance for change, um, whether that's in journalism. Uh, for example, we support investigative journalism, which in the last year, we don't ask people to report on certain stories. We report, uh, we support them in whatever they report, but uh, uncovering corruption. So by allowing the public to understand what's happening with their own tax revenues and how corruption and that malign in influence is happening in their judicial systems, um, in their private sector, is taking away from uh, public services that can be provided to citizens. So they might have a uh, greater hope for the future um, and a chance to stay here as a way that we're going to operationalize CMKI and make sure that it's successful um, because it really is about the citizens of these countries and that they have all the opportunities going forward and the youth choose to stay in BIH instead of um, immigrate to Europe because there are better opportunities for jobs and stability. So it's that working with other donors, finding change agents within the government and finding uh, change agents uh, within the private sector that are willing to stand up for um, civil society and values are some of the ways that we're going to be able to make this a success in the future. We can't do it alone. Yeah, I think that's a sort of leads into a couple of the questions that we received on on the issue of cooperation. Um, we've had uh, cooperation with uh, raised with the EU. I see questions about EEAS, the External Action Service, uh, but also um, in this region to DG Near um, plays a critical role on the on the assistance side. And I was wondering if I could sort of bring you in to talk about that. And I've seen recently even the EU has put out sort of, uh, you know, sort of what it wants to see as areas of increased engagement uh, with the United States. And um, I know on the ground is, is sometimes uh, is you, you're doing things that, that none of us in Washington or elsewhere might see or, you know, or know that it's happening. 
Uh, but maybe we could speak to that, maybe uh, speak to that. And I, I maybe uh, if I could bring in, uh, you know, both Scott and, and, and Jim too, and Brock, please feel free to jump in. Fiona, you can speak to sort of how that looks and what that might look like. But I know Scott too, even with the, uh, with Maya Sandu's election, there's a, you know, increased focus, um, particularly by the EU and obviously should be from the US too, about how do we engage a Moldovan government that now has somebody, a president elect there who's very focused on democracy, on addressing corruption um, in a way that we have not seen. And I'm, I can speak to this externally. Nobody else has to, you know, sort of uh, not putting any words in any months, but the previous governments have had a challenge in addressing these issues um, and, and haven't uh, shared, I think, that commitment. So how do we, how are we working with partners Nancy, you mentioned too, I mean, obviously the multilateral, uh, you know, the iffies are really important because of the macroeconomic needs. COVID-19 has really impacted the economic needs for these countries as well and will be going forward. So if I could just bring Scott, if I could bring you in and, and then also Jim and Brock and Fiona, anybody who wants to sort of come in on this, but I think it's, I think it's a critical question that I've, I've seen throughout a number of the questions is about this issue of cooperation. Yeah, um, th thanks, John, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, definitely cooperation uh, is always gonna be important, um, certainly in, in better times, but uh, you know, during a pandemic, then I think cooperation really comes to the fore. You know, as the resources are scarce, you know, impacts are, are large and uh, the challenges you know, just become bigger. Um, you know, with, the, with the election of, uh, of Maya Sander, there's certainly as a lot of, uh, of promise and I think expectations, and um, it will be, uh, you know, due to the different um, responsibilities and authorities of the of the presidency versus um, the parliament. I think it will be an opportunity, but also a challenge to to make progress. You know, in in areas where the country previously has, has struggled. I think certainly the you know the election was was telling in terms of of a of an electorate that was hopeful of change. Um, that was expecting, you know, uh, a country to emerge from, you know, a past that's been plagued by corruption, plagued by, you know, malign interest of all sorts, really, um, that uh, has really prevented the country from really moving moving forward. Um, I think from our perspective, uh, you know, USAID really has to to work very closely with uh, with our, our counterparts, with the EU, um, with the Brits, um, really across the board in in terms of. Uh, making sure that our programming is 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 coordinated, aligned, um, you know, really working towards the problem, uh, and I and I think you know with uh, with Moldova's um, uh, ascension towards the EU, there's a, a clear goal in which we all do work closely towards. I think economically is is one one place that's uh, that's quite easy, um, and uh, and we've been able to basically work together um, on on joint projects uh, to help expand trade. Um, and really reverse, uh, you know, the a, a trajectory of trade that in the past has really kept Moldova uh, vulnerable to, um, to to having you know avenues of trade you know shut down for political purposes. So I you know I, I definitely agree. Uh, cooperation is incredibly important. Um, getting on the same page in terms of objectives, and that will be key to continue those, those discussions once. Uh, my son who takes office um, and uh, we see what happens in terms of the, the future with uh, parliament, if there's snap elections, et cetera. Jim. Great, Jonathan. I, and I would just echo what Scott and Nancy are talking about in terms of the importance of the collaboration with the European Union, uh, as well as the UK. And certainly that's the case in Ukraine uh, where uh, the cooperation in areas, let's let's say energy, for example, where the whole focus is on energy independence, uh, protecting the security of Ukraine's uh, energy supply, reducing dependence on uh, connections into Russia, and helping drive it and push it forward towards a more uh, Euro-Atlantic European uh, set of institutions and structures. Uh, but really, the core effort here is uh, anti-corruption work. Uh, because ultimately that's what is driving uh, the citizen trust in the government, uh, citizen belief in democracy in Ukraine and in a democratic future. Uh, and by together with the EU and several other key donors, 
working on anti-corruption, uh, increases citizen trust, it reduces the space, it makes the, the ground less fertile for disinformation, uh, for misinformation. Uh, and when combined with engagement with civil society, and I know Nancy was getting at this, these sort of non-government actors, and Dr. Hill, non-government actors, uh, they have a big role to play uh, in terms of also reducing that space uh, and making the ground less fertile. Uh, we've sort of started calling it like organic resilience uh, to disinformation campaigns. And the, the more educated and informed uh, citizens are, the, uh, and the more belief they have in their own identity and sense of national unity, and in a democratic future, the less effective uh, the malign influence, uh, various forms of malign influence is. Because we can take that on directly, and we are, uh, but there's a lot of indirect ways to reduce the potential success of malign uh, influence uh, from Russia and other places. Yeah, and that, and that, and we're going to turn, I'll turn to Fiona next too, but, but you see this in a number of the questions too. It's one, there's sort of issues of cooperation. The other one is, you know, there's, there's um, a lot of actors that are sort of, um, and we just talked a little bit about Moldova um, and sort of internal challenges that, um, that have held back countries, particularly in these, in, in these regions. Um, and how important it's, I try to do it, but I don't think I did it artfully at the beginning to, to say three for one, because I think this does so much to strengthen the, the, you know, the ability of citizens and countries to address the internal challenges as well. Fiona, can I turn it over to you? Yeah, so I just wanted to actually make a connection between something that Mark Ambassador Green said and, you know, where James and, and Scott and Nancy have been putting on emphasis. And I think I'm sure that Brock will want to pick, uh, pick up on this because there was a lot of questions, um, you know, that uh, point in this direction. I think the overall message is that we're building forward together to kind of riff off you know, some of the, the building back better, you know, mantras that we've been um, hearing uh, most uh, recently in our political space. And you know that that means you know being very creative and pooling resources because you know though USAID does amazing work, you know I'm, I'm sure that Brock and all of his colleagues would say you know the resources are somewhat limited, and so you know you really have to be very creative here in you know finding the space in which you can add the most value, and I think you know what Mark was saying uh, about the US approach is is really key, recognizing our own vulnerabilities, making sure that everyone knows that we're in this together having um, you know kind of a lot of humility about what we're doing and again that mantra we're building all of this forward together with our partners and what James was talking about um, anti-corruption uh, um, I think there was a, a question in uh, the Q&A um, from Damien Murphy on Capitol Hill about the role of Congress there's a very important legislation going through the US Congress that tackles these issues of corruption at home money laundering and you know all of the issues that we need to do to get our own house in order and I think that's a very powerful message to other governments, you know, for Scott um, in uh, Moldova, where my Sandu is trying to, you know, work on this as well, that if we can do something at home to address these, that's also setting an example, as Mark was saying, for other countries as well. And we can do this in conjunction with our international partners. And it's not just the EU and the UK that's in the mix here. There were a number of questions about South Korea and Japan, but I would also want to flag Canada and um, you know, other countries that have very strong development sectors and also very strong anti-corruption activities. And you know, we've, we've thought about things in the G7 context for our partners in which you know, Canada obviously and Japan uh, come into that context and also again, South Korea. They also have very strong uh, development entities that we work with very closely and USAID does too. And then individual countries, some of the biggest donors um, in the areas and arenas where you know, our colleagues from USAID are working are individual countries um, like Austria and Germany, uh, which have separate budgets that also work on uh, these fronts as well. So I think this overall message of putting our own house in order together and learning from what our colleagues in other countries are doing, as well as setting uh, uh, best practices and examples is, is pretty critical and working with the largest uh, number of donors possible who also have very serious programs that Brock and colleagues uh, connect with at all times. Definitely. And I, I just wanted to highlight what you said. I think it's so important about getting our own house in order and some of these things too, uh, so we can help those countries best address these issues. <clears throat> and then also that the panoply of, 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 of development partners globally is, is significant 
but Europe tends to be our largest development partners, the EU. <clears throat> Thank you for mentioning Germany as well, uh, but a number of others that are contributing. I just wanna ask Mark Green, and then I'm gonna turn to Brock to close off. Unfortunately, we're, clo we're closer to the end and we have many questions in the queue. Some of them are really sort of directed individually to mission directors. We may not be able to get to them, uh, to all of them, but I wanted to just go to Mark Green, just because you've, Ambassador Green, you've heard sort of this, this conversation, because I, Fiona, everybody was pulling together different threads of this challenge, and uh, you've seen it from various spaces too. Thanks for also highlighting the congressional uh, role in this too, because I know there's strong support, um, uh, you know, and there still is, you see a new legislation to support uh, Belarusians now uh, rolling through Congress as well to support their democratic aspirations. But Ambassador Green, can I bring you in uh, for this? And then Brock, uh, we're gonna give you the final word and I apologize to everybody, we're not gonna get to all these questions. Ambassador Green. Well, so first off, uh, the good news is that the effort that we're all talking about uh, does have partners both sides of the aisle and all parts of the US government. Uh, this is something Congress cares about deeply. And I think that the path ahead in bolstering these tools and strengthening the approach of CMKI is alive and well. So, you know, I remain very optimistic and I'm optimistic because despite the, um, you know, the temporary wins and, and the pricks that we see coming from uh, Kremlin sharp power, at the end of the day, again, this bargain that we offer of helping countries to rise and meet their own aspirations will prevail. It but will only prevail if we're clear uh, in terms of the differences, willing to talk about our own flaws and working and listening to our partners to see what their needs are and how we can forge a path ahead together. That's the whole basis uh, of the mission that we have uh, at USAID. And the uh, CMKI report shows how it applies to a region and uh, what it can offer our partners who are willing to walk with us on the journey. So uh, again, my thanks to everyone involved in this. Uh, the release of the report is great. I think it really does lay an important framework for the future, one that I am confident uh, will go beyond the current administration and be embraced by the next one as well. Ambassador Green, thank you. Brock, I'm going to give you the final word. And, um, and also just a, a congratulations on, as the ambassador pointed out on this report. Um, I think there's a lot of work that went into this to get this stood up and then to where it is now. And there will be a lot of work uh, going ahead. But uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. And listen, I want to thank all the panelists uh, and Dr. Hill and Ambassador Green for joining us today. Uh, we couldn't have done it without your support. Uh, and leadership. But look, I, I think it's important, Jonathan, as we think about where we are today, we're here on the internet in an open, transparent uh, uh, forum. This CMKI isn't being done in a box. It's not in a vacuum, right? We're actually talking about it. So that actually gives the Kremlin that opportunity to listen to how we can actually find that common ground. I think it's important that we're always going to have to counter the, the Kremlin and, and other authoritarian regimes um, but look, I, I don't think that um, democracy needs to be on the defensive, right? Countering is a, a defensive. It doesn't have to be on the defense and it doesn't have to be on the offense. I believe that democracy gives every citizen that opportunity to have a voice. I've said that before, I said it earlier in the day. And I believe that with partnerships, we can push back on the polarization that we've seen. And I think that that's going to be uh, a key aspect to how we work together, not just amongst our partners like DG Near, uh, and it's been a, re a real pleasure working with my counterparts in DG Near and other countries, but having forums like this, we had a forum in October, if you recall, uh, where we actually had Canarita and myself talking about these issues. It's important that we talk about them openly and we talk about them uh, frankly, and we look to see how we can find that common ground, and we're looking forward to doing that. Uh, on that note, Brock, thank you. And uh, looking forward to seeing everybody again. Hopefully we'll be in person, you know, and I appreciate the one thing that you said too here, especially was about transparency, about a willingness to talk about these issues. Um, there's no, there's no uh, magic uh, or silver bullet for these challenges and it will require, I think, everybody uh, working together to address these issues. 
So on behalf of the German Marshall Fund in the United States, my colleagues as well, those who helped pull this together as well, your staff, Brock, who are, who are amazing as well. Thank you so much, uh, Fiona, Ambassador Green, uh, Jim, Nancy, Scott, uh, great to see you all and looking forward to seeing you again, uh, hopefully soon. Good luck with everything that you're doing right now. Um, and thank you so much for everybody who participated and joined again. Sorry, we didn't get to all your questions. Have a good, good rest of your day, morning or afternoon. Take care. Thank you.